All right, everyone, I think we'll get started. This is our last panel for the day. And then after this, we'll have one more short break and then our final keynote of the day. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Wan Young So uh, to take us away. Thanks, Wan Young. All right, let's get started. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Wan Young So. Um, I'm a PhD student at the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. So it's such an honor to actually moderate the panel titled um, Evictions, Housing Security, Insecurity, and Technology. So the housing stability is really critical to lower income tenants and communities of color in general. And um, um, one of the, you know, big determinant of this housing stability is actually evictions. So people who experience um, evictions are disproportionately black and Latino renters, and particularly black women, according to prior research. And many of them ended up um, seeking homeless shelters. And um, even after they got uh, housing vouchers, the housing search process is really challenging because of this, all of the tenant data including the credit scores, eviction record, and criminal records, and compared to the tenant screen algorithms. So I think these stories are actually of housing security are actually, um, I would say, it's a data problem. So their residential and credit histories and criminal record and eviction record are used to create these tenant screen algorithms. So as we saw a lot of different um, technological landscape um, around housing today, um, it's called PropTech, or the one of the panelists, Erin, who will be joining on the Zoom. Um, she coined the term Landor Tech. So these data and technologies at least represent and for worse exacerbate um, the current power relations or the racialized social systems that we are living in. So to discuss such issues, we invited uh, awesome um, um, housing scholars and activists who are at the intersection of um, housing um, and technology. So I look forward to having the discussion. Um, now each panel will introduce um, themselves using their each uh, three to five minutes. So why don't we just start? So we already have the presentation slides. So let's see who's the first. Is it me? Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Click her up on the oh. Yeah. Ah. All right. Is it the green button? The big green button. Okay. okay. All right. Hey, everybody. My name is Jessica Bellamy. Uh, my pronouns are any all, which just means you can use any pronouns for me. I'm a researcher, tenant organizer, and information designer, meaning I do research. I support the creation, launch, and maintenance of structured tenant-led campaigns. And I use designs such as visuals, interactive story maps, infographics, et cetera, to break down complex information so that everyone at the table can share the same understanding and knowledge. Um, uh, and that's essential for building grassroots decision-making processes, strengthening leaders through shared and mutual learning, and uh, so many other reasons why it's so good to break down information for everybody to understand. But um, some tenant movement, movements that are happening where I'm from, which I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, that's where I'm based. Uh, one being the Historically Black Neighborhood Assembly, which is a tenants movement fighting against gentrification and developing social housing and policy solutions to help us remain and some, for some cases return uh, to our communities. And another powerful and mighty uh, tenants movement happening in Louisville, Kentucky is the Louisville Tenants Union, uh, which is focusing on issues with landlords and other renter-centered issues. So. To give you some context about Louisville, uh, because I imagine that's, of course, that's my basis of experience uh, as far as, as looking at housing as, as an issue. It's, um, Louisville in itself, last year, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications published a survey saying that there were three top uh, uh, cities who have the, some of the strongest constraints facing our black renters in this country, and that was Chicago, LA, and Louisville. You might also heard of Louisville because of the murder of Breonna Taylor, which uh, myself and my colleague Josh Poe, when we started the Root Cause Research Center, we, we took on a lot of different research projects. And one of the ones we took on was making this comprehensive story map connecting the, the 
policing with property, specifically in Louisville, and walking through what that story looked like. Why was Breonna Taylor murdered, and how is it connect connected to the city's development interests, which is available. We presented on that uh, last November with UCLA's Luskin Institute on Inequality and Democracy uh, on a panel called Property, Personhood, and Police, Countermapping Nuisance from Louisville to Los Angeles. So I shared a stage with uh, uh, also Aaron's colleague, uh, Tara. I wanted to give a shout out for Tara, because she's amazing too. Um, but I'm here today because I want to make sure I'm build it, building in context, not only for um, what's going on with tenant power movements, but also making sure that that everything that I speak to can help folks think about class struggle and where class has a role. Because we've talked a lot about race, but in that conversation, we haven't really talked about class and how that overlays on things. And I want to make sure that um, I can highlight any instances that make those connections between property and police uh, and what it looks like to actually actualize housing justice. Because it's not just the work that we do fighting issues, but it's also about establishing those abolitionist geographies. Um, uh, and creating new housing systems that are outside of market rate housing um, and, and essentially the scam of affordable housing. It's a phrase coined by the LA Tenants Union. Shout out to the LA Tenants Union. Um, but yeah, uh, so I appreciate your time. Glad to be here. Thanks, Jessica. And next. Next. Eva. Awesome. So hi, it's really great to be here with you all. Um, my name's Eva Rosen. I am an assistant professor at the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. Um, and I'm a little jealous of all Jessica's great pictures. Um, I just have one for you. Um, so broadly, I study housing policy. I study poverty and housing discrimination. Um, a lot of my work um, is in this book right here, which came out in 2020. It's about housing vouchers. Um, and I really set out to try to understand a little bit more about um, folks who receive housing subsidies in the form of a voucher. What does that mean for them? How does it help them? Um, but also, how does the program um, fall short in many ways? Um, why why is it that we see so many vouchers concentrated in racially segregated neighborhoods and especially poor neighborhoods? Um, and how can we understand how it is that they end up in those kinds of places? Um, voucher holders are disproportionately poor, of course. They are also disproportionately people of color. Um, and so trying to understand how this housing subsidy sort of interacts with this already pre-existing set of vulnerabilities um, was really interesting to me. In doing that, um, what I came to understand was that landlords played a really big role perhaps not unsurprisingly to many of you, um, but a bigger role really than I had expected in where people end up. And that's because in part, you know, the program is now called the Housing Choice Voucher Program. We think that it is designed to provide tenants choice. Um, and in many ways it does compared to some of the alternatives like public housing. Uh, but as it turns out, landlords play a really big role in where people end up. Um, and landlords um, are motivated uh, in, in most cases um, by by, by sort of fairly rational models of profit. Um, they run businesses, and, um, and so when they have a say in where tenants end up, um, tenants are ending up in places that are profitable to landlords, not necessarily places that are profitable to tenants. And so thinking about um, how landlords as actors sort of enter into the scene um, in this hugely funded federal housing program um, was really important to me to sort of layer on to, of course, also understanding tenants' choices tenants' preferences, um, where tenants want to end up for all kinds of different reasons. And as I really started to understand what was happening in one city, in Baltimore, so we typically think about um, landlord discrimination as um, trying to uh, keep tenants of color out on the part of landlords or trying to keep voucher holders out. And interestingly, I sort of uncovered a neighborhood where sort of the opposite was happening, at least in terms of vouchers. So this was a neighborhood that turned out to be very profitable for landlords who specialized in vouchers. Um, and so I sort of borrow from Kianga Yamada Taylor's turn, predatory inclusion, to think about the ways in which landlords in certain contexts and certain neighborhoods are actually pulling voucher holders holders in and actually making it harder for them to sort of make a, make a full set of choices about where to end up. 
Um, so from there, I've studied landlords in, in four different cities, um, and I've started to really focus on um, landlords of different sizes, of different backgrounds, those who do and don't rent to voucher holders to try to get a better sense of um, how they're interacting with tenants, what their approaches to eviction are, um, and also how they screen tenants, so how they actually select tenants in. We talk a lot, uh, we haven't yet today talked a ton about eviction, but I think in public policy we talk a lot about eviction as a big problem. Um, landlords are also making really important decisions on the front end in terms of who they bring in and who they don't bring in, as well as, of course, who they exclude and, and who they evict. Um, and then lastly, I've done a, a fair bit of work in Washington, D.C., where, of course, I work now um, looking at eviction trends in the city um, and working with the city council and with local advocacy groups to try to get a better understanding of what's going on in terms of eviction in our, in our nation's capital. And I can come back to it, but I think it's, there's some really interesting stuff there when it comes to data in terms of um, it being a place that has historically had um, a lot of access to eviction data, um, but not a lot of uh, transparency in, in the ways that I think would actually help. Um, and has, has the, that kind of data access has in many ways been very harmful to low-income tenants of color. So thanks, and it's great to be here. Thanks, Eva. And next, Alora. Hi, my name's Alora Raymond. I'm an assistant professor uh, at the School of City and Regional Planning at Georgia Tech, uh, and I'm very happy to be here. Really enjoyed uh, this day so far. So thanks to uh, you all, and thanks to the organizers. Um, I run a little planning and property lab, and I think we work on four different research areas. Uh, the first is looking at corporate landlords and uh, large corporate investors, and uh, relating um, these sorts of landlords to displacement and dispossession uh, through residential housing systems. Um, I also I uh, have some projects on displacement after disasters where we look at evictions after hurricanes and also uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and try to understand how housing systems and housing institutions can amplify inequality uh, as, you know, during recovery processes. Um, I, uh, we also work on um, an eviction-based uh, sorry, <laughs> the Southeastern South 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 uh, Evictions Data Collective. So we've pulled together different institutions to uh, track evictions in Atlanta, Macon, and Savannah. And we've worked really closely with tenants organizers, legal aid groups, and uh, local government uh, to try and keep people in place and also uh, reduce housing instability, particularly during the pandemic. Um, and then the final bit that we work on is uh, sort of my origin story where on my mother's side, I'm a Pacific Islander, and uh, we do research on informal land tenure um, and customary land uh, in the South Pacific, um, and also look at gentrification and displacement uh, in you know, places like Los Angeles where you have a lot of migrants um, living. So I think the two projects that we've worked on recently that really relate to this, uh, the topic that we're talking about today, uh, first is a paper that I wrote with Desiree Fields on racialized geographies of housing financialization. And in that paper, um, we talk a bit about racial capitalism and housing. And, and then we venture into the financialization piece where we think about what's going on with um, the data systems that are attached to housing institutions. So you think about finance, it's oftentimes um, a lot of data. <laughs> um, and there's a couple of concepts that come out of that paper that I think really relate to the evictions data tracker that we built. And one is the idea that um, under capitalism, you don't just find systems that discriminate against people along racial divides. Capitalism is actually a system that creates racial divides and other types of divisions between people. Um, and so that segmentation process that um, at once creates inequality and legitimates it is something that we see time and time again. Um, and then the other aspect that comes out of that paper is uh, the discussion about the way that um, risk is individualized. And so you take systems and institutions that are perpetuating an inequality and you legitimize them by creating um, fictions around individual responsibility. So the evictions data tracker that we built uh, was based on code we used to do a paper in 2016. 
uh, we were helping our local legal aid group, and they uh, were very interested in understanding more about how evictions data could be used for housing, um, for preventing evictions. And the first thing that you notice about evictions data is that it takes a systemic process, right? In Atlanta, we have, um, in Fulton County, uh, about 200,000 rental units. We have 40,000 eviction filings every year. So that's 20%. And about 6% of those, right, five to six, about one in 20 households, ends up with a completed eviction. Um, and th those are spatially unequal. So that's the average rate, but you can imagine it's two to three times higher in given neighborhoods in Atlanta. So eviction, um, people being kicked out of their homes is routine. It's not this rare occurrence. When you look at the evictions data system, there's no indication of this systemic practice or of the institutions and the organizations that are creating this risk. It's individualized. It's, you see the tenant name in each row. It's very easy to identify the tenant and what happened in their case. It is literally impossible to assemble data about the landlords. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was take this tool for individualizing and legitimating housing instability, and we linked it to property data sets to try and understand what the organizations and institutions creating housing instability were. And so we were able to find that there are certain landlords that are associated with very high uh, housing instability in our city. And that's, I think, from a data perspective, um, What's interesting about that tool, the other thing that we do is we try and use this data to empower communities. Um, we're also helping policymakers. We work with the Atlanta Fed. We work with the Atlanta Regional Commission. But we recognize that there's a power structure in housing. And that can't be solved with individualized solutions. And so what we need to do is build community power and lend our resources to groups like Housing Justice League um, and others. So. Thanks. Thank you, Arlo. Um, maybe the next is Erin. Can you hear me, Erin? Yes, yes. Um, can you see me okay? Yep. All right, thumbs up. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for um, convening this one, Young. Um, I'm Erin McElroy. I'm, um, I'm an assistant professor of American Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I'm also the co founder. Um, of the anti-eviction mapping project, which is what I'll be talking about today. And I'm, I'm only 10 minutes away from you all. I was hoping to be there in person but um, and, and flew to, to Cambridge, but um, I woke up feeling sick today, so that's why I'm zooming it. But I hope one day to, to meet everybody in person because it's great to be on the same panel with everybody. Um, but yeah, so I co-founded the anti-eviction mapping project in 2013 in San Francisco, and a lot of my own housing organizing work takes place still in the San Francisco Bay Area, some in New York and also some in Romania, um, but I'll focus on U.S. organizing and, and data and tools today. Um, and so, yeah, the anti-eviction mapping project, it's a da data analysis and data visualization and critical counter cartography collective, and we produce maps and zines, data analysis, reports, murals. Um, we even have an atlas now, all to support the ongoing work of housing justice. Uh, we started in San Francisco in 2013. Um, in 2017, we launched chapters in New York City and, uh, and Los Angeles, so those chapters are newer. Um, and yeah, we formed primarily at first because I, at the time, was part of an eviction defense group that was um, practicing mutual aid called Eviction Free San Francisco. And we would have meetings and people could come in um, and share stories about their evictions and we could you know, determine if we had the capacity to help them organize against their landlord. Um, and so 2013 was this time in San Francisco of this big tech boom. Some people call it the tech boom 2.0 or the second dot com boom. And this attracted a lot of new wealth to the region and real estate speculators of course wanted to capitalize upon that. Um, and so we started to see that evictions were going up um, proximate to certain forms of tech infrastructure. So um, these Google bus stops, for instance, uh, would uh, serve as private luxury depots for workers in Silicon Valley to live in San Francisco. We found that areas proximate to these tech buses um, and tech bus depots were um, the sites of rental increases, but also eviction increases. Um, but then the other thing that we started to notice was that many tenants were coming into our um, meetings not knowing who their landlord was, who was issuing eviction notices to them or harassing them due to some of the same contacts that were already 
talked about, but um, we started doing research really to identify who these corporate landlords were, um, all of which hide behind you know, this vast network of limited liability companies and limited partnerships, um, making it really, really difficult for tenants to know who's actually evicting them or who their, their landlord is. Um, we would hear a lot of stories about you know, tenants who've been paying rent on time to particular landlords for decades, and then that landlord might sell the building to something like 55 Dolores Street LLC or what, what have you. Um, and the tenants wouldn't necessarily know that that was a, a subsidiary or a shell company for a bigger investment company. Um, and in San Francisco, it wasn't Blackstone or Invitation Homes or these big um, Wall Street-based investment companies buying up single-family homes that had been foreclosed upon and, and that had uh, gone through racial dispossession, but rather um, these kind of mid-sized corporate entities that were buying uh, multifamily rental units and uh, issuing eviction notices. Um, so we began doing a lot of research and still today, one of our tools is called a Victor book that we built um, in partnership with a coalition called the San Francisco Anti-Displacement Coalition. We're now also building a, a version for Oakland in partnership with housing groups in Oakland. Um, and it allows you to uh, look up an address or look up um, a corporate network and see all of the, the properties associated with it and who the the main actors are. Um, and we really wanted to build this to support multi-building um, organizing. It's a lot easier to organize against a corporate landlord or really any landlord. You can have tenants in different buildings or different units in the same building, organizing together and fighting back together. So that's been one of the main, um, one of the main projects that we've been working on. Um, we've also done a lot of analysis about eviction data. And granted, this is mostly in um, the Bay Area, New York and LA, which have um, strong tenant protections, but also you know, huge eviction rates um, and very different types of evictions. So, um, you know, for instance, during the pandemic, we've noticed an increase of nuisance evictions, which are highly racialized. Um, there are even apps that different cities put out so that neighbors can basically snitch on other neighbors if they consider them a nuisance. And that, you know, is accompanied by criminalization and new forms of, of surveillance. But landlords themselves um, are increasingly installing facial recognition and biometric uh, cameras in the entrances of different buildings. Um, and this is something that I've worked on with Wan Young um, for a project called Landlord Tech Watch, where we've been um, studying the different surveillance technologies um, that, that landlords are using and how it seems to be in these various moments of crisis, um, technology uh, is augmented sort of through the logics of, of crisis capitalism. So um, it's, you know, tenant screening itself emerged in the 1970s in California um, and then augmented a lot with different you know, advances in technology, but then it really skyrocketed after 9-11 um, under the racist auspices of the, the war on terror. Um, and now we see it, you know, rising again, uh, taking advantage of the algorithmic systems and technologies to really reproduce systemic racism and, and uh, systems of carcerality and houselessness. Um, and you know, it's many tenants are today still scared to organize because they know that if they do that, you know, their name could end up on a court record which could be kept, used against them in um, trying to access future housing. So, so what we're trying to do is shed light on, on what these platforms are, how they operate and produce popular educational materials um, and public scholarship that can be used in different uh, coalitions and networks committed to housing justice to to uh, promote tenants in understanding um, who is who is surveilling them and who is evicting them, and it's you know it's ironic that today tenants don't even know the names of their landlords, where landlords know so much about tenants through these increased means of data production um, and data grabbing. So that's that's what I'm up to, um, and I'll leave it at that for now. I'm happy to get more into all of this in the conversation. Thanks, Erin. Um, yeah, so maybe let's start um, by discussing the eviction first and the eviction data. Um, as a data, you know, the eviction records are created. And then, you know, the who files the eviction? Landlord files the eviction. So we need to actually understand the, um, what's the motivation of the landlord. And then, the, you know, we've been talking a lot about these corporate um, entities and how they file the evictions. Or those kind of things are really important to understand uh, how eviction data is created. So, the, so I'm just asking to all of you that the, you know, the, the, you know, the landlord behavior and then the, the, the types of um, landlord 
And depending on the types of lender and the size of lender, the, maybe the patterns of the eviction filing would be different. So the, why don't we just start discussing about this? Well, it's, oh, go, ahead. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I'd say that um, evictions data comes out of, I mean, there's, there's illegal evictions, right? So when we talk about evictions data, we're talking about evictions that are happening through a formal court process. Yeah. And I, I don't think we have comprehensive understanding of you know, what proportion that is, but when we've seen survey research, you know, we find that in some cities it's half, right? So half of the people who are displaced are going, there's a court trace of it, and the other half, it was a cash for keys type situation, or um, Ava can talk more about uh, the, all the different variations of how landlords uh, kick someone out. Um, state courts are really varied, um, and they're creatures of state law, landlord-tenant law, and so um, what types of traces are created through the court system um, varies by law, whether or not you, you need, you, you know, what the laws are about um, serving notice, about answers. Um, some states have suppression where uh, you only really see a record if there's a debt judgment, right? So when I said in Fulton County that we have uh, you know, 40,000 eviction filings, um, you know, but many less eviction judgments, right? In some states, you would only ever see the eviction judgments. You wouldn't see that 40,000 people had that shock of seeing, oh, I'm sorry, that's my mic, um, that shock of seeing a, um, a notice on their door. Um, so I would say first that the data doesn't cover everything, that it varies by state law. Um, and so sometimes we can't see even all of the legal evictions that are going on in states like Wisconsin and California. Um, the plus side of that is in Georgia, if there's just an eviction filing, whether or not it's dismissed, it's automatically sucked up by CoreLogic and LexisNexis, and it follows you um, for many years. So, I would like to add on what you <laughs> said. Um, yeah, and and when we think about evictions, there's more than one kind of eviction. Like just like you mentioned, there's what's happening through the court system, but there also are you know a lot of. Uh, uh, self evictions that happened because I know we talked about vouchers in Section Eight. If you get an eviction on your record, then you might not be able to find housing. You're going to likely lose that Section Eight voucher. And so, a lot of people, if they're being threatened by their landlord, uh, harassed, there's their their housing is jeopardizing their health because it has black mold and it's infested with this, that, and the other. A lot of people will either stay into the problem so bad, you know, because uh, they don't have another option, and if if eviction is being threatened then they'll just leave, you know, and, and um, anyone who's ever been to eviction court, it is the most ugly thing <laughs> because uh, at least in Louisville, Kentucky, which to be real, we call, so I work at the Root Cause Research Center. We founded it, me and my colleague Josh Poe. Um, and uh, we have this, this incubator where we teach folks uh, research methodologies and they launch their own projects based on their own personal experience, which begot the Louisville Eviction Lab, right, that was started by tenants in Louisville. And when we started collecting um, um, uh, a lot of, of this information together and analyzing what things looked like, we had to realize it through the identity of the city, which is that it's essentially a plantation state. Like it's a Confederate monument. Most of our cities, or most of our, our streets are, are highways named after Confederate soldiers. The Derby is just a, is Confederate pageantry. Um, and uh, our court system is, is pretty much the same where our judges, um, uh, they're always gonna be in favor of the landlord. And when you're there to support, you know, a tenant who is going through an eviction process, uh, oftentimes you will hear the judge do their best to coerce, which thank you Tawana Petty for saying the difference between consent and coerce, and coercion in that last panel, um, to coerce that tenant to not seek further actions and not create a hearing to call the landlord who's a mega corporation to be in the courtroom rather than this person who's a representative. Uh, our, our legal system, and I imagine in many places around the country, our court systems are built uh, for, for the, uh, the landlords. And just to put a class analysis, because I said I was going to do it in there, is we have to realize um, from many of our scholars who have looked at the history of, of racial capitalism in this, in this country, um, uh, to have land is to have citizenship. 
You know, that, that is the, the bar. That's the threshold of recognition. And if you do not, then you are less than, right? And if you don't even have a home, you're even less than that. Houses people have less rights than anyone else, not even property rights. Um, and so uh, uh, those who, who are our wealthy developers, those who are our landlords, our land ho holders, um, the property class, they are always uh, centered. And it is in their best interest to continue to exploit the way they do so they can continue to increase their profits, which under capitalism is encouraged, right? Like the more you can maximize your property means you're doing, or your profit means you're being, su you're successful, right? Um, and, and so like our whole court system, our entire legal system is centered around that. And so even in instances where there was absolutely illegal eviction, when we had a moratorium against, you know, folks who weren't able to, to pay their rent, that you still should be able to stay in your home, it didn't matter. And it didn't matter if the news reported it. It didn't matter. Illegal eviction happened everywhere and it happened rampantly and no one stopped it. Not because no one cared, but because the power holders were like, yeah, that's what we're doing. It's cool with us. It's in their self-interest, whereas for tenants who are suffering uh, the cost burden of capitalism, um, uh, we are the ones who have to, to uh, 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 endure this harm, endure this exploitation through our labor, through our rents, um, and, and, and it supposedly deal with it. But building that system of political power amongst tenants, which was also something that I think, was it, was it I don't remember, it was at the first panel, it might have been Ben Green, somebody mentioned political power. Um, building that political power through structured campaigns, through popular education and various other means to get people galvanized to start uh, not only pushing back a bit against tenants, but finding ways to decommodify housing because it is a human right. Taking housing out of the market and, and putting it somewhere else where we can have a life affirming uh, communities where poor and working class people can still be poor and working class but still have homes. You know, you don't have to be rich to have a good life, to have adequate, adequate housing that is safe for you, you know, that can be permanently affordable. Those places exist now more than ever. Um, and I can speak more to that later, but sorry, that was broader. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> that was great. Um, yeah, one, one thing I can add to that, um, backtracking just a little bit, so thinking about this difference between formal and informal evictions, um, there have been some estimates of informal evictions. They seem to happen at a, at a much higher rate, actually, than formal evictions, but in many ways, they're unseen. When we look at the formal data, um, we do see, as Wang Young pointed to, some really big differences um, in different kinds of landlords. So whereas smaller landlords tend to file for eviction less frequently, when they do file for eviction, those evictions tend to end up in, in an actual court ordered executed eviction more frequently than for larger landlords. For larger landlords, for these corporate folks, what we often see is that um, they file at very high rates. They file as soon as they're legally allowed to, depending on what state they're in, as soon as the tenant is late, often without even talking to the tenant about seeing where that rent check is. Um, and what's interesting here, and I think speaks to what, what Jessica was talking about, is that they're not always filing. In fact, they're often not filing with the intent to actually evict. And the way that we sort of know that is that most of the time, these filings don't end up in evictions. So Laura cited some statistics from her site. In Washington, DC, only about 5.5% of all filings end in a court-ordered eviction. And some of that is due to tenants um, leaving before the actual eviction to avoid some of the um, negative things that come along with the, the sheriff or in DC, the US Marshal showing up at your doorstep. But, um, the, the point being that um, landlords are filing with the intent um, to sort of put the power of the state behind their request for rent collection, even in cases where this is a tenant who every month they pay on the 14th instead of the first because that's when they get their paycheck, right? And so this is, this is not an unfamiliar process. Um, and so to, to another one of Alora's points, when you look at the data, you see all of these individuals, um, but in addition to aggregating by landlord, you can aggregate by tenant. So tenants are frequently receiving multiple eviction filings per year for the same unit. If you're receiving mm -hmm. multiple eviction filings per year in the same unit, you're not getting removed from that home. Why? Because you're probably paying. You're just paying late. And so when landlords file on tenants in this way, this is what we call serial filing, they're sort of, I mean, they're, they're A, as I said, they're sort of putting the, the power of the state, the power of the courtroom and the judge behind that request for rent collection. They're allowing the tenant to go seek aid at a local charity, at a church, right, to get emergency rental assistance, to get a payday loan, as we were talking about in the previous panel. But they're also changing the power dynamic between themselves and 
the tenant. So they now have something over the tenant. If that tenant is doing something the landlord doesn't like, the landlord has that threat of eviction in their back pocket. Um, and so this, this filing um, really isn't just about getting the tenant kicked out. And in our interviews with landlords, what we learned is that it's, it's really costly for landlords to have turnover in their units. They actually don't want turnover. They actually don't want to evict tenants. Um, but they do want to have some control over their tenants, and they do want their rent to be paid. And so filing for eviction, even when they know that rent is on its way, is a way of sort of changing that power dynamic in, in ways that are really consequential for tenants. So one of the interesting things we see in Atlanta is that there are patterns of high serial filing versus um, removing, you know, evictions with the intention of removing. One of the research studies we did, we looked at whether um, there was an eviction spike following a large corporate investor purchase of an apartment building. And what we found was that um, there's a much higher odds of an eviction spike in the year after a large corporate investor purchased relative to a neighboring census tract that didn't have um, that sort of eviction. But there was no corresponding increase in filings. Um, so what really spiked was the number of um, eviction judgments, meaning evictions, mm -hmm. where they followed through to the end with the intent to displace. Mm -hmm. um, the other interesting kind of discrepancy between kind of eviction, serial eviction activity and like evictions with the intention to obtain the legal right to remove a tenant um, is after the pandemic, we started tracking the rate of serial filings uh, in each county. And we found that once landlords, this is me interpreting, I haven't gone through our interviews yet, but um, once um, tenants lost the ability to pay because so many people lost their jobs, the rate of serial filing in Atlanta fell by 10%. And so a lot of people said, what's going on? Eviction filings have fallen, but some of that volume was never intended to displace. It was only intended to leverage the ability to get tenants to pay. Um, and so hypothesis. When landlords knew that tenants couldn't pay, they didn't bother with the serial filing. Um. Do you want to add, um, Erin, anything about, since you are done um, amazing work about the evictor book, so the, basically you can identify some you know, relationship between the corporate landlords and then the eviction patterns? Sure, absolutely. Um, and yeah, it's important to note too. So in California, um, there's a state masking law that prevents um, eviction filing at the county court level, um, all of that data can't be accessed um, to prevent tenants from um, the tenant screening industry. Of course, um, companies like American Information Research Services still kind of scrape court websites and produce a sort of lower count of um, evictions than actually occur because of their scraping methods being uh, flawed and, and data being hard to access. Um, but in cities in California that have rent control um, and that have uh, rent boards. Um, so cities that have, you know, renter majority, um, uh, well, cities that are renter majority and many of them have had uh, rent control through tenant struggles that were fought in the, um, in the 70s, late 70s and early 80s. Cities like San Francisco and Santa Monica, LA, Oakland, et cetera, have rent boards. And so we're able to get petition data from those rent boards through record requests and, um, so that doesn't show the outcome of eviction. So that doesn't show if it amounted to an unlawful detainer or if the sheriff came, um, but we can see the intent um, or the type of eviction um, that's being issued. And so, you know, there are two general categories of evictions, um, fault and no fault evictions. Um, there are two types, or, well, three types of no fault evictions in San Francisco um, or in California. Um, one is called the Ellis Act, and that was a, a piece of statewide legislation that was written in 1985, um, after the city of Santa Monica gained uh, rent control through tenant organizing. Um, and so what happened was this um, young trust fund kid, Jerome Nash, inherited a building full of renters and he wanted to just evict them. Um, he didn't want to be a landlord. Um, but because of the tenant protections that were gained uh, when rent control was gained, he couldn't just evict them for no fault of their own. So um, he befriended a senator, uh, Jim Ellis, and they crafted this, this piece of legislation called the Ellis Act, uh, which allows landlords to evict tenants for no fault of their own. Um, and so that was written in 85. It didn't get used um, in mass until the late 90s with the dot-com boom, and then again with the tech boom 2.0. There are also owner movement evictions when owners claim that they're gonna move back into units. Uh, we saw in, in data from 19, the late 1990s, owners would claim to be moving into multiple units at the same time when they couldn't physically be doing that. So they were just using that to sort of bypass um, 
other other forms of um, eviction or having to go through them. Um, and then there are demolitions when, when uh, building use changes and often our buildings are demolished or, or something changes drastic enough that it's considered a demolition. But in all of these cases, tenants have more time to fight back. Um, they might have 30 days or 60 days, depending on the type, if it's no fault. Um, and no fault evictions will target often multi-unit um, rent controlled buildings because the premise is that if you if you evict tenants um, for no fault of their own through a no, no fault type of eviction, you have to evict all the units in that building and then you can't re-rent. But if you're an investment company that has a zillion different shell companies, each of those can individually evict a whole building. And as long as, again, 55 Dolores Street LLC doesn't re-rent um, elsewhere, that's okay. So there, this is all just to say that landlords are always finding ways to bypass different tenant protections after they're written. Um, so tenants are always organizing against these types of no-fault evictions. And often there's more sympathy from press and media uh, for no-fault evictions and, and definitely less for fault evictions, uh, like three-day notices to pay or quit, which are the most common type of evictions. And, and as was already said, many don't actually amount to physical displacement. Um, but there are also nuisance evictions, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and so there was, you know, in the in COVID, during COVID, there was, of course, an eviction moratorium. There are many, there are over 200 different moratoria in California, if you look at all the cities and counties, all functioning differently. But, um, and then the statewide and, and the federal, but most of the local ordinances um, banned most types of evictions, except for often nuisance evictions. So we saw then um, a, a spike of those being used as landlords realized that was strategic. Um, and so I guess what I'm getting at here is that there are different waves and trends of what types of evictions are being used, often depending on what policies are in place or what protections are in place as a way to bypass them. Um, and then, yeah, lastly, I would say that um, what we've been noticing with new surveillance technology being deployed um, in buildings, you know, cameras on building entrances, basically making tenants scan their faces to enter their buildings. Those are often being um, sold to landlords uh, under the guise of, of technology useful in um, detecting uh, lease violations, particularly illegal subletting. So there's a big market for you know this technology. Now you can, if you surveil who's going in and out of the unit, you can tell if it's actually who's on the lease. Um, and so this is, a new trend that we're seeing emerge. Um, but I'm, I'm talking just about California and some New York City um, data and, and instances here. I wouldn't say that this is happening across the US at the same rate by any means. Yeah. You want to add? Yeah. I want to add, definitely. Yeah, I totally agree, Erin. This is happening in um, a lot of different places from like just, just thinking about the way nuisance ordinances are used and property tax expanding the, the carceral design of buildings and neighborhoods, right, for containment, for observation. Um, uh, but the nuisance ordinance specifically, I just want to reference Louisville because um, uh, for folks that might not be familiar with nuisance ordinance, it's essentially if the police get called to your house, something could happen next, right? Uh, a nuisance ordin our nuisance ordinance in 2018 was expanded uh, to include uh, any type of misdemeanor re re uh, involving uh, drug paraphernalia. So if a police officer smelled weed, they could go to your house. And that one visit to the house would be enough to then pressure that landlord to evict you within 72 days. There are people in Louisville, Kentucky that were evicted because of domestic violence assaults. You know, you call the police because you're being assaulted by a partner and police come to your house. They, they, you might get a nuisance ordinance served that later leads to your eviction. There are plenty of people that have experienced this and there have been news coverage of this. Um, but they just wanted to expand on some of those things that Aaron had touched on in the context of, of the country. Um, do you want to add? Yeah, um, so let's then move by, since we are talking a lot about how eviction are filed and then the, you know, the, how landlord actually, you know, with, with, with what motivations and then the, you know, types of landlords are different patterns of evictions. So the, but then the, these eviction data are now kind of starting a long trip from the court, um, court uh, housing court to, you know, third party data brokers and then ended up with the, tenant screening services. So I really wanted to bring this as a kind of, you know, 
you know, downstream effect or as a tenant screening services. So the, um, yeah, this is something that is really connected to this, all the um, eviction data kind of creation and then ended up with the tenant screening services. So the, I just wanted to ask particularly to Erin or Eva who are doing a lot of research on the tenant screening. So for those who are not familiar with this tenant screen algorithm, so the, could you describe how tenant screening algorithm works and then what's the kind of implications in terms of racial discrimination? Sure. Erin, do you want to start? Anyway, go for it if you sure, want. Sure, sure, sure. So um, yeah, I think that it's really important to think about this kind of full circle where we get from the eviction sort of back to the, the screening moment because of course when someone um, has to leave their home they have to find somewhere else to live um, and low-income people in particular tend to, to be making a lot uh, more moves than other populations and so they are searching for housing and they are um, often in the position of getting screened for um, a new unit. So um, I'll talk about it a little bit from, from sort of not from the landlord perspective but I'll talk about what I learned from sort of following landlords around and watching how they do this screening process. So what landlords are, will say is that they are really interested in finding uh, what they call the good tenant, right? And the good tenant is someone who pays rent on time, who doesn't cause problems or nuisances, right? <laughs> who, um, who's sort of easy to manage and deal with. Um, but of course, um, these characteristics are sort of completely unobservable to the landlord from the get-go. I mean, arguably, um, these are sort of hard to predict even in the abstract, but certainly um, they're, they're hard to know from the pieces of information that the tenant gives you. So what we find is that with our smaller landlords, they tend to rely on, on what they call gut checks. So they're sort of drawing on um, uh, often very stereotypical notions of, um, of their tenants. So um, class, race, um, uh, motherhood, right, how all of these things intersect. So they do things like home visits of, um, of tenants' current, current homes um, to see how well they keep the home. They do things like uh, smell tests where they actually check to see how well the kids are groomed um, and, uh, and the sort of intersection of race, class, and gender here is, is really, really um, apparent. When you get to the larger landlords, the larger landlords, the more corporate landlords are very concerned about fair housing audits. Um, and so they tend to be the ones um, relying on these data screening um, software programs. Um, and, and that's where this really interesting conversation around data, um, I, I think, enters in. Because on the face of it, it might seem like relying on these objective criteria that you can get. So our, Aaron can talk more about this. Um, but there are these uh, third party companies um, uh, that, that Aaron mentioned, right, that aggregate data. Um, they, they look at credit reports. They look at um, sometimes criminal histories. They look at residential history, so whether or not the tenant has a history of a and they aggregate this data and come up with a score. Um, and so what the landlord gets is basically like a risk score. This tenant is risky, this tenant is not risky. They all work in different ways. Um, you should rent to this tenant, you shouldn't rent to this tenant, you might want to rent to this tenant, but they have a history of eviction. Um, and then the landlord can make a decision based on what level of risk they're willing to accept. And so by using the software, it in theory protects them from fair housing lawsuits. No one can say that they racially discriminated or that they discriminated based based on this or that if they're using this, um, this screening software. But of course, as we've been kind of talking around all day, um, even when it comes to things like credit scores, credit scores are um, highly correlated and re related to um, systems of historic and current disadvantage along racial lines, um, historic and current uh, racialized mortgage lending practices. Um, we know, of course, about the disparities in car incarceration. And so by relying on these tools, landlords are sort of um, um, protected, but at the same time, um, they are still very much discriminating. Um, so I'll leave it there and see if one, Aaron wants to jump in. Sure, no, that, that helps set it up very well. And, and yeah, I love the work that you've done on this. Um, yeah, I would just add, you know, so of course, tenant screening as an industry, it started through this company in uh, the mid 1970s in California called UD Registry. Um, and uh, and that's often considered, you know, the origin of the industry. But of course, way before that, I mean, you can go back to um, earliest settler, settler colonial moments in the U.S. Surveillance has been used by landlords to kind of protect the value of their land and um, at times uh, enslave people on their land. So there's not a there's nothing new about um, surveilling tenants. But something changed in the mid '70s through advances in digital um, technology. 
um, and, and simple things like Microsoft Excel even uh, allowed companies to start collating and collecting data in new ways. Um, and so, yeah, a bunch of other companies took off in the 80s. Um, they were mostly at the time just using eviction data. So UD, unlawful detainer eviction filings. Um, and like I said, uh, you know, then with uh, credit uh, screening becoming a bigger industry, and that, of course, also augmented after 9-11, um, we started to see uh, tenant screening companies weave together uh, eviction histories, criminal record data, um, and uh, credit data. And this, you know, there's been a, a lot of important lawsuits against tenant screening companies for violating the Fair Housing Act and also um, the Fair Consumer Reporting Act. Um, one of the interesting things is I think that lawyers who litigate against these companies might be trained either in housing law or consumer law, but often not both. And there are different ways to sort of attack them through both. Um, and there have been important wins. And there was, you know, an article, I think it came out last year that screening companies are now facing this national reckoning because of some of these lawsuits with CoreLogic promising to get out of the business. But, um, but the, you know, there are over 2000 registered tenant screening companies that we know about, um, and apparently nine out of 10 landlords use them according to research from the markup. Um, but you know, it's, it's a very unregulated industry, so we don't really know how many there are um, and, and you know what's being done informally. But yeah, as was said, I think the corporate landlords are definitely, um, they want to apply these blanket approaches um, because it's easier. And if you look at the, the rise of corporate landlordism, after 2008, um, you know, that's, we see these corporate landlords like Blackstone or Invitation Homes needing um, to outsource property management because they couldn't, you know, possibly manage all of the properties they just acquired. Uh, so there was this big turn towards digital platforms, um, and we also see the rise of the prop tech industry happening in this moment. And now a lot of prop tech property management platforms might include a screening, uh, you know, component in them. So these, these different systems are all kind of getting packaged and sold to landlords together. Um, but yeah, I think one of the um, interesting things that, though is that uh, they are getting this data from LexisNexis, which is of course a horrible company that's colluding with ICE and doing all sorts of things, but it, it's pretty, um, you know, so New York has created different laws to protect uh, data from screening companies and in terms of uh, bulk downloads. So LexisNexis will send uh, employees that are probably not getting paid that much to housing court um, to just uh, set up tripods and take photos of the computer terminals and capture data that way and enter that in their database. And really any data that is in the housing court system. So it could be that a tenant complained against a, an abusive landlord if that data is in the system that could still surface in, um, in the tenant screening report. So it really is a way to, it's a political tool that landlords use, I think, to make tenants scared of organizing um, and of complaining against landlord abuse. Um, but there was a, a law passed in 2019 in New York that bans the, the blacklist, the, um, the tenant screening blacklist. So if, on paper, at least ten, landlords in New York state can um, uh, blacklist tenants for prior eviction instances, but they can still uh, blacklist tenants for poor credit or criminal um, record data. And um, this, of course, reproduces cycles of carcerality. You know, if you're coming out of um, prison and you have that mark against you, it's going to be a lot harder to find housing. So there, we can see different ways that these cycles are reproduced through the industry. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. So I had a couple of thoughts about how this relates back to the first panel where we talked about the idea of accuracy and removing bias from data sets. Um, because I think that there's a couple of ways in which tenant screening tools, um, that's not good enough. <laughs> you know, it's not, we don't have a problem of accuracy. Um, there's kind of deeper structural issues at play. Um, and I, you, you know, you see this often, I think, in like for housing law or, you know, in employment um, issues where you think, well, if we can move, remove the discretion of managers, right? Um, and if we can create a colorblind system to implement the rules, then racism will be gone, right? Um, and there's a couple of things that I'd um, suggest are at play here. One is that in housing, we have wildly segmented markets. So I think Ava wrote, <laughs> um, co-authored a paper just pointing out that landlords are often not in a situation of deciding between tenants of different races. Um, and made a really interesting point about how race still plays a role in that there's a racialization of tenants who are you know, within um, a given racial category, but 
you know, because we have segmented markets, what we sometimes see is that landlords practice very differently and operate very differently in different places. And that's how housing inequality emerges, and that's how we have differences in housing instability. If you look at a map of evictions, right, they're happening in predominantly black neighborhoods in Fulton County, um, where I live. Um, the other issue is just to reiterate that, again, Landlords are a significant source of risk. When we looked in 2015 at large corporate landlords who bought post foreclosure homes in Atlanta, what we found is that while the average eviction filing rate for single family homes is 7% in Atlanta, some of these firms were filing for eviction against 30% of their tenants, even after we controlled for tenant demographics at the block level. The landlord brought the risk. Just like subprime lenders issued predatory high risk loans to prime borrowers, the whole premise that the tenant is being screened for risk is wrong. Mm -hmm. There's institutional factors that are creating higher risks of housing instability, and the same landlord-tenant dyad in a different state, in a different city, um, in a different context, would not result in an eviction. And tenant screening tools just place all of that institutional and systemic bias on the backs of the tenant. Um, and we, you know, we talked about the historic stuff that's being fed into these systems, even setting that aside. Um, the other thing I'd say is that I'm more familiar with credit scoring tools like Equifax, et cetera, and I don't know all 2,000 tenant screening, screening tools. What I will say about credit scores is that they're graded on a curve. There's no scenario in which everyone gets an A, right? If everybody makes another on-time payment, we don't all get a higher credit score. They don't drift up, upwards over time or downwards during a crisis. They always have that same shape. And that means that this is a tool for differentially subordinating people and allocating housing to some but not others. Mm -hmm. It's not a tool in which everyone can have access to shelter. Mm -hmm. And that's when you trace back the legacy of where these came from, from life insurance tools when you know, it was ruled that you had to include non-white customers and they started to say, okay, let's create all these scores and let's figure out the pricing. Um, you know, it, it, it really makes sense. Um, and, and then the final two point that I make is that credit scoring emerged in order to do risk-based pricing, right? And risk-based pricing is inherently path, it creates path dependencies in which if you're riskier because you're poorer and less wealthy and you're charged more for that, you will stay that way. And your neighbor who is, has a higher starting point is gonna pay less for, for their rent or whatever. Um, so for all of these reasons, I think that tenant screening tools can't be made more accurate, or CoreLogic can't just you know, remove this factor that's correlated with race. Um, the, the ways in which these tools generate inequality are deeper. Yeah. So I want to apologize because we went into our question time, but uh, what you all are saying is so important, these last couple points especially. Thank you. Um, really powerful, and I'm glad that we made those points. Um, I want to say we have maybe time for one question. So that, sorry to put that weight on you participants here. <laughs> but does anyone in the room want to ask one question to this incredible panel? Great. I, oh, wait, we have two. Shoot. OK, let's, ha let's hear both questions, and then uh, we'll get some simultaneous answers. Mm -hmm. Three questions? Oh, wait, maybe we have three. Let's hear all three. Okay. Um, I know there's been a lot of, con first of all, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask a question about for all the conversations about the individ individualization of risk and how that gets pinned on the tenant, I wonder if there's a way to kind of look at risk of the landlord and ways to maybe measure that in, in a way that, I don't know, that looks different than what it looks like for um, the tenant. So hold the thought, hold on. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for uh, the talk. I had a quick question about linkages of data, and I think Dr. Raymond, you touched upon that. Um, I guess, like, formal eviction data, how can it be linked uh, to health outcomes within the household among relatives? Because um, for outcomes like youth suicide or, you know, like opioid-related deaths, you would like to not just have some sort of association study or survey that would follow like an adolescent, let's say, and understand the role of psychosocial factors towards their development, but also, um, you know, at the individual level, going back to this question, um, figure out the link. And so, of course, for the non-formal or 
illegal evictions, the best we can do is association studies or ecological studies, but at the individual, given your experience linking these data sets, I was wondering whether you could comment on the one with uh, health outcomes for all the household members, including youth. I'm not that good at designing causal research on the fly, so I think having individual, <laughs> I, honestly, I would probably do like an ethnography or something, you know, because linking the data on an individual basis and make, you know, with health data can be hard um, because typically when you see, unless you can get the clinical data, administrative health data sets tend not to be identified, and so the lowest you can go is like the zip code. Um, so you're going to have a problem really understanding what's going on at the household level unless you're doing a survey or an ethnography um, or some kind of, in, you know, high touch type of research method. That would be my best guess. Yeah. I would say something brief on the, on the other question. I, I think Alora's work points to a really cool way in which you can flip the statistics around and look at, at how landlords are bringing the risk, exactly as you said, I'm gonna quote you on that phrase, um, and how if we look at the rates on which landlords are filing on their own properties, we can, um, we can control for relevant things and we can actually see really important differences. Um, and I'll just leave you with one statistic that comes into my mind from the work in DC, which is that if you look at the 20 landlords who are doing the most evicting across the city, they account for 70% of all of the filings in the city, just 20 landlords. Um, so I think flipping the way we look at these things around um, and actually looking at what the landlords are doing um, can, can help to, to get at what you're pointing to. So, thank you. I th I th I'd add too that I've been advocating for a national registry of landlords. Like if you own residential housing, mm -hmm. um, we need to know who the beneficial owner is. And then I'd love to see some market power studies of you know, how much power do given landlords have in a submarket? Um. Amazing. Anyone else want to respond before we close it up? Um, I, I just really appreciate any attention where we're looking at um, the source of the problem, such as the landlords and uh, the development plans of the city and, and all of that. Because I think too often in, in, in housing research, you see a deep study of, of the individuals experiencing the problem. And um, uh, that puts the onus and weight of solving the problem on those in individual experiences versus um, uh, the people that are actually creating the problem, that are creating poverty, that are creating conditions of housing that, that aren't healthy, safe, um, or that, that are restricted. Um, and so I, I really applaud you know, everybody on this, this board and that's been in the part of this conference and the questions that apply to that. That's all. You're the old board. <laughs> time, right? We are over time, so maybe we'll <laughs> close it there. Um, thank you. Please, a huge round of applause for this amazing panel. And see so all we have our last uh, coffee break, so please take the next, I think we might only have like 10 minutes or something, um, grab coffee and a snack, um, and we're coming back to hear our last keynote talk. Um, by the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Right to Housing. So it's gonna be really amazing. Um, and we have a special closing activity uh, planned as well. So I'm not even gonna say what it is yet. <laughs> but stay tuned and, and come back after the break and we'll see you soon. <laughs>